Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, two renowned state policymakers grade the state's efforts in meeting the needs of vulnerable and disadvantaged Minnesotans while ensuring funds are well spent. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. For more than a decade, lawmakers from both political parties have stressed the need to curb the growing cost of assisting vulnerable and disadvantaged Minnesotans. During that time, state funding for health and human services has continued to inch upward, largely due to a growing state population and the ongoing pressure on many state and county programs. Commissioner Tony Laurie, a former senator who is widely respected for his work in this field, now joins me in the studio. Welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Glad to be here. So before we get into the highlights of the, the Health and Human Services budget bill, I want to get your perspective on the long-term future of assisting the state's most vulnerable individuals. Is the Health and Human Services budget growing at a pace that is unsustainable? And in your view, if so, um, did this legislative session do anything to bend that cost curve? Well, we are cognizant of the growth trends in health and human services, and it's largely driven by demographics. We have an, olding, an aging and, and sicker society as we, as we age. Mm -hmm. um, and the, you know that is more care needed, and more of it falls to the public sector. That's where most of the cost growth is in recognizing that, and those are very difficult conversations because we are a very um, caregiving state, and we work on this very hard. But we put together a blue ribbon panel that is charged with trying to take a very uh, intense look at how do we try to con control costs moving forward. There's a lot of ideas on the table. Um, the, the goal of this is to produce $50 million a year in savings in the, in the next uh, budget setting um, cycle. And I think that, I think we're, that we're up to that challenge. And it's across the entirety of the health and human services system. You know, so that would be, you know, health care, certainly a piece of it. It would be um, older adults, you know, uh, nursing home, assisted living. It would be um, uh, disability services as well. Um, it would be child care program. So, I mean, uh, efficiencies and, and certainly um, if we can find uh, fraud, we, we can work on that too. You know, so all of these pieces could play into that um, ability to try to take uh, some of the uh, trend out of our Medicaid spend. So potentially new reforms coming down in, in future years to just try to keep yep. a lid on the on the costs. Let's dive into some of the highlights. One one that is near and dear to your heart, I believe, yes. is the Minnesota Family Investment Program. Those families who temporarily receive assistance uh, will get $100 more per month. This is the first increase since 1986. Yeah. What was the impetus, other than the time, but why did it take so long? You know, every single session has its own unique set of circumstances, and somehow between the governor, the legislature, the House, and the Senate, it hasn't made the cut. It's been proposed every year that I've been here, many, many people. It's never been a partisan issue. Um, there's been a real commitment to do this, but at the end of the day, and it, it has fallen by the wayside in every year. And you know, you'd have to ask me in a particular year. I have uh, a dozen years of stories about how it fell by the wayside in different years. This year, we all had a strong commitment, and we got a hundred dollars a month increase for uh, some of the neediest families, children uh, across this state. And it's just something that I am. Uh, so proud of finally having accomplished it, it is going to make a real difference in people's lives and it uh, you know our programs our public programs really work you know um, people families that need our assistance they come they get our assistance we help them not just with cash but also with job seeking and training and uh, uh, hooking up uh, p uh, families you know individuals and employers and they get off our pro pro programs and they have a more sound foundation upon which to build their family and be, uh, be a more contributing uh, member in, our, in their communities. It, our programs really are a success story and we heard so many of those for so many years. Getting this across the finish line, it just really is very near and dear to my heart. I've been working on it a long time. Well, another thing that, that people struggling benefit from is child care assistance. Yep. The child care assistance program has been under criticism for fraudulent claims. Will there be enough safeguards to ensure that the right people, the neediest people, 
are receiving the help that they need and those who are gaming the system are caught. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, one, one slight correction there. It's, it's mostly on the provider side that most of the fraud occurs, okay. not the individuals. Um, and we do have, we did bring forward a, a very um, robust set of program integrity measures, uh, really designed at making sure that every dollar that we do um, invest in uh, child care assistance makes it to those families and those children that are in need of care. Again, to build the family's assets, to be able to, to support um, th themselves and their communities. This is a really important program that helps families work. And we, we are going to have uh, attendance record changes. We have a lot more investigators on the street. We're really um, uh, helping to draw a line between um, civil investigations and criminal investigations. We can do many more civil and we can focus on those and really you know, help providers that are, that are those that are trying to comply, uh, be, come into compliance and, and really prosecute those that are actually acting in a fraudulent manner. And I think we're gonna have a much better, I know we're gonna have a much better um, result from the, the conversation that the administration and the legislature had around this important topic. One of the marquee issues as we leave the 2019 session behind is the continuation without a sunset of the health care provider <laughs> tax. The health care access fund, um, how many Minnesotans will benefit from this ongoing support and how will that money be spent? Well, to, to be just totally honest, every single Minnesotan benefits from the sustainability of the health care access fund. There are 1.2 million people on our public programs, Minnesota Care and and uh, medical assistance, and that's, you know, this is a, a primary funding source, the Healthcare Access Fund is, of both of those programs. But, but it's also a, a tremendous investment in the health of our people, our families, and our communities. I mean, this is, Minnesota is consistently amongst the healthiest states in the country. Not by accident, but by design. And it comes from a willingness to invest in the health of our, of our state and our people. And, and key to those investments over, um, since 1992 has been the provider tax. And so removing that sunset, you know, adjusting it a little bit, it went from a 2% to a 1.8. Um, that was, uh, you know, uh, acceptable. But we have no sunset. Uh, we have security that we're going to be able to continue to focus on how to make these investments and make them work for the people of Minnesota. Another change this legislative session was the tax on opioid manufacturers and distributors. Yes. That money is going to pay for this ongoing opioid crisis. It seems weekly in the news there are more deaths from addiction. How quickly will better treatment and recovery efforts be available to those who need it? Yeah, there's, you know, the opioid stewardship fee is one piece. We also have many substance use disorder uh, uh, pieces within the Health and Human Services bill that DHS is working on, working with providers. So, I mean, we're improving that daily, uh, working hard on that. The opioid stewardship fee and those funds will be available in about a year. It'll take a little bit of time. And, and they're gonna work on prevention, they're gonna work on treatment, they're gonna work on some of the downstream, more downstream effects too. We have a significant investment in, mm -hmm. in the child protection system, which is, you know, a, uh, uh, we've had the uh, you know, children taken away because of uh, an addiction it has been going through the roof for a long time. So, I mean, we're recognizing all of the effects and, and we're gonna be working hard to implement that in a way that, that really helps us bend that curve as well. Well, and a related issue really is mental health, uh, both for schools and communities. A new initiative will place behavioral health clinics throughout the state and more schools will now have mental health programs. If you are someone or you know of someone who's experiencing depression, anxiety, how do you get help? How do you find these resources? Well, you know, I think that the, the, the certified coordinated behavioral health clinics, we did uh, make them on a financial uh, footing that, that is able to continue into the future and expand them from six existing sites today to a total of 11 by the end of this fiscal biennium. Um, and it's really a powerful tool to bring behavioral health together under one roof. That's mental health and chemical dependency and serve the whole person and meet them where they live. So expanding that to another five communities is going to be uh, really instrumental. You know, um, people are gonna need to reach out to their uh, county workers. There's, you know, there's statewide helplines. There's, there's help in many regards. Um, and one of the key pieces that I always try to stress with people is look at seeking help 
as a sign of strength, not as a sign of weakness. You know, if you're in need of uh, a little help counseling, it's, it, we have very effective tools to help get people on a better path, to lead a better life. And people don't take advantage of those tools nearly soon enough. I, 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 upon first experiencing mental health issues, it takes on average 10 years mm -hmm. for somebody to come forward and ask for that help. And so we're building the suite of tools. We're trying to put behavioral health together because the co-occurring disorders are so common. Um, we're trying to not keep things in silos um, and really uh, treat the whole person. Uh, and those services will be coming online. Um, the, the, you know, six of the sites are available right now, another five coming online. We're really excited about the behavioral health uh, pieces of this budget. One more thing before we go, uh, briefly. There are more efforts now to protect senior Minnesotans. There was the, yep. the fraud and abuse and assisted living and nursing homes and all of that. We have an ombudsman. We have other things that are coming in place to help our elderly population. How will these efforts improve under the care for these elderly folks improve under Governor Walls? Well, I think that making sure that we have uh, protections for vulnerable adults. This is something that we've worked on for several years. I was actually the, the chief author in the last uh, year in the legislature trying to get this across the finish line. Being able to come from this perspective and work with my partner in the Department of Health, uh, Commissioner Malcolm, in getting this across the finish line was a big uh, achievement for this uh, legislative session. And a big kudos have to go to the legislature too. I mean, everybody came forward. This was a consensus package that's gonna have uh, assisted living licensure for the first time in Minnesota. We're gonna have uh, enhancements to the Adult Abuse Reporting Center. Uh, we're gonna do a much better job of making sure that we have the backbone to protect people and information for people to understand their rights and, and uh, how to choose the right facility for them and their loved ones. Commissioner Tony Laurie, it is always a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, the time goes way too fast, John, and it's good to be here. Senator Jim Abler, as chair of the Human Services Reform Committee, has been fighting for ways to improve aid for those in need while making efficient use of taxpayer dollars. He joins me now to talk through some of the highlights and challenges of the state's next two-year budget. Thanks for being here. Hey, we made it. We made it. We got to the end. The only divided legislature in the country. We finished pretty much just a little over time, and yeah. it's something to be proud of that Minnesota can make things work. And, and was able to compromise on important things, including health and human services. Honorably so, compromising. Honorably? <laughs> yes, you yes. pray it's honorable. Yes, honorably compromising. Uh, one of the key accomplishments of this budget, as um, Commissioner Tony Laurie, Laurie spoke about, is the increase of $100 a month for the poorest of the poor, those who receive the Minnesota Family Investment Program. Is this a good step forward? Well, it's just humane. It's been almost three decades since it's been increased. These uh, families get $435 a month. And, and it's a transitional program, I'm trying to move them into independence. And it's hard to become independent when you can't even afford rent. And so the $100 is a very good thing. We did something else on a related thing. It's a program called a spend down. So if you're low income and have a disability, you have to spend down of your limited resources to get into the Medicaid healthcare system that you really need because you have a disability. And so these people are paying two, three, four hundred dollars a month to get into very low, of their low money. And so we abolished that in 2022. This has been going on for all, also about three decades. And it's been very troubling. And it's a, these, these two together make it a really positive outcome. That's so the progress for, for those who are truly in need. Uh, there was a news report last summer that highlighted some fraud in the child care assistance program, which people around here refer to as CCAP. The legislative auditor followed up with recommendations. Did any of those recommendations make it into this next budget? Absolutely. It became a big deal. And it's not just since last summer. It's a decade ago and longer that we've been looking at eligibility and the integrity parts of the program. And actually, people lie sometimes. And sometimes they're, they're just ignorant or naive, but sometimes they're actually fraudulent. And DHS found that 7% of the CCAP payments were fraudulent, which is a lot. And that means there's more than that. And so we made a big effort in the Senate to crack down on integrity. And I think that drew the governor and the department along to have more integrity. The bill is full of integrity. And so we were unwilling to add more money to childcare until we were sure that the money that we're spending was well spent. 
the governor wanted to spend like $80 million more, and we said, no, no. Uh, we're going to take care of people with disabilities and other things instead, but we'll work on integrity, and then we can talk about trying to uh, ex expand money. But actually, if you do the integrity part and the eligibility, more people will get services because it's not being stolen, and the people who need it the most will get it. And so that was a very constructive outcome, and done in a collaborative way, and at the end, we all agreed. Well, and so then relatedly, there will be the formation of a Blue Ribbon Council that will look for waste and fraud in public programs. Uh, what do you think they'll find? And program efficiencies. We spend $37 billion every two years on the health and human services niche. That's a lot. The whole state budget is $48 billion now. And there, so part of that money comes from the feds. We spend half and they give us half. But $37 billion. If you found 5%, that's $2 billion. And so we're suggesting that they find a, a fraction of a, a, like a percent or something that they could do better. I'll, I'll give you a hint. If you have $37 billion of programming, you can find $100 million that you could better spend. And as we struggle to do that, um, it'll actually it'll help people believe in the programming more and so we can do more to serve the people with the greatest needs and, can, and have people work their way through to become independent and have the life that they want. None of the programs we have in our human services programs are places you want to spend your life on. You want to kind of get the help and move along. Some people really need it and you know, we want to serve them. But if you can be independent, especially like in disability programs and, and so on, let's go there. And it turns out that actually saves money, but it really saves people's lives and it saves workforce, which is a major issue. Um, they're not making enough people apparently and so we're we're running low on people that are willing to serve in this this industry. Well, and that was a that was a next question that I had was, you know, the state has this overall challenge, as many parts of the country do, of simply having enough workers. But the population that cares for those in need and the elderly, which is a growing population, uh, whether personal care, assisted living, nursing homes. Are we finding enough workers? How can we find enough workers? How can we pay them a decent wage? Well, that's the problem. We tried to address that in the Senate this year. It turns out it, within six years, we'll be short 40% of the PCA hours, 40%. That means you're awarded 10, you get six. It means you, have, you, need, you need 10 workers, you have six. I mean, it's like, holy cow. And so at some point, we have to decide who do we really, who, who can we serve? Who can we realistically fit into the lifeboat? Not even about the money. This isn't even a money issue. This is about enough human beings in the state to do the work. And so we discussed at a great length to raise the acuity of people we choose to serve and find some alternate ways that are maybe less uh, substantial to help people with what they might need. And then move them to independence, which also requires less work. And so that's an ongoing challenge. We'll tackle that again next year. Uh, let's return to child care just for a moment because there is a shortage of child care providers, especially in greater Minnesota. Is there anything in this next uh, two-year budget that's going to help alleviate that need for child care? Well, and so there's the centers, but they're mostly metro. When you get out to greater Minnesota, it's licensed homes, and they are getting pummeled with regulations and foolish oversight that doesn't change anything that doesn't make a child safer. Safety is everything. But the providers actually have to work at this. And these are people working 10, 12 hour days. Um, and we tried really hard to take some pressure off of them. And this is one area we did not agree on. We cracked it a little bit, but um, uh, we're gonna keep pushing the governor and uh, the commissioner, but they need to, to let off the oversight in some ways. And there's things called fix-it tickets. If you have some unflushed toilets, they can give you a citation for that. Or you could just go flush the toilet. You ever see a little kid not flush the toilet? Could happen, <laughs> or there's some debris in the yard. Um, that's a citable thing. And so now on the website, they had three citations, two unflushed toilets and some debris in the yard. Really? And so, and, and they used the wrong water bottle for some kid. Like, holy cow, those are not like life safety things. And let's take the pressure off of those. Let's make sure that there's no dangerous things, that the people are well background checked so that no predators get in the business, so that parents can leave their child off and feel safe. So we have more work to do, but I was really disappointed that we could not come to an agreement on that. And I, I and anyway, this is too bad. More, more, work, more work on that topic. Uh, one more question. There have been dueling opinion pieces about the failure of the Alec Smith Emergency Insulin Act to become law this session. Uh, you and several members of your caucus have asked the governor to call a special session uh, to address the problem of people 
in emergency situations who need insulin, life-saving insulin. What are you proposing? Well, and I think part of this was just because there was so much material jammed into the end, and then things went offline. And I think if more of this could have been public, we could have sorted our way through this, because there's a strong interest in making sure that no one else uh, dies for lack of insulin. And these are, he was a 26-year-old, aged off his parents' insurance, couldn't afford the $1,300 because of his high deductible if he even bought insurance. Um, and so that should never happen in Minnesota. And, and so we proposed that you would actually uh, use some existing mechanisms in the uh, state programs to, uh, to reach out and make a difference about that. There's a strong interest on this in a bipartisan way. And I think at the end we can sort something out. And um, focusing on the needs and saving lives, and uh, that provokes us a lot. And I, I think that well, something will come out of it at least by next year, if not sooner. Senator Abler, we have to stop there, but thank you. Oh yeah, thanks. Happy summer. Historian Brian Pease talks about one of the unique features of the state capitol in our occasional series, The People's House. The Minnesota Capitol incorporates stone from all over the world, and architect Cass Gilbert ruffled some feathers when he chose a Georgia white stone for the exterior. Why did he make that choice? What he was trying to do is emulate what he had seen in the Chicago World's Fair or the Columbian World's Exposition of 1893. That was called the White City. And so that whole concept was you're trying to bring back the uh, center of democracy, which would have been Greece and Rome, and you'd bring back those architectural features to help inspire those citizens and the people elected to work in those buildings. And that was stone, the stone from that, that area was white. And so he wanted that Georgia marble stone because that was a beautiful white stone, relatively newer quarries. They hadn't been really exhausted or used a lot until uh, the 1890s. And so this was a, a perfect stone, he thought, for the exterior of the building. It did create some controversy because what you want in Minnesota when you're building your own state capital is Minnesota stone. So we have plenty of granite and we have sandstone and limestone. So people were saying, let's help the people of the state by building our capital with materials we can take out of the ground right within our boundaries. And so he pushed against that. Um, and the other part of that too was uh, you had the, the unions, you had the carpenters and you had the stone cutters and carvers and all the people that are supposedly getting jobs here. You want them to have the jobs to do the stone carving here. So the fear was if you buy stone from Georgia, they're going to cut the stone out of the quarry, they're going to dress the stone down in Georgia, all the people in Minnesota are going to lose those job opportunities. So they worked out a compromise? They did, yeah. So the Butler Ryan Company, the general contractors to build this capital, went down to Georgia, bought the quarry, and now you cut out that middleman. So now you can set, send up all the materials raw, and in the northwest uh, corner of the Capitol building site, they built their own stone mills and, and stone carver sheds. So people were hired from Minnesota and the, the local areas to do that work on site. So it was a win-win for everybody. I counted at least 21 different types of stone in the Capitol. Why is there so much variety? Well, Cass Gilbert, once again, is trying to recreate these Italian Renaissance buildings. And so they were bringing in stone from all over Europe. And so you have, because of that variation of colors and tones, you can really create some beautiful architectural vistas. And you can look down one end of the building to the other and see different types of stone, different colors. And so he incorporated as many of those different stones from throughout the world as he could to incorporate into the decoration. And some of them are really small scale stones and others are huge columns from Italy, for instance. And you have stone, uh, the stone points in the star in the rotunda, those uh, pinkish, orangey uh, triangles are from Africa. And then there's the balusters and the railings on the second floor are all from Greece. And so there you just get a good sample of some of the stone that he was bringing in to make this a really beautiful building. And so here we are on the second floor, the grand floor of the rotunda, and there are columns all around. Some are Italian, some are Minnesota. Talk about the different kinds of stone and how we incorporated it into this space. Right. They, once again, you have this palace to talk about all these different types of stone from throughout the world. But you also want to remember this is Minnesota state capital. 
So the second floor rotunda is really a showplace of that Minnesota stone. All the interior wall stone is a Casota limestone, which is a pretty common building material today. He was one of the first to actually use that rougher limestone, have it buffed and polished to look like, make it look like a marble. And so that's what we see on the walls right here around right. us. Right, and then that set the whole color tone for the rest of the interior decoration. You know, what matches those, those tan tones throughout the building. Plus he used these big columns, granite columns from Minnesota on the east and west side of the second floor rotunda. Some huge granite columns from Ortonville. So once again, you're showcasing some of that granite industry of the state. And so then above those columns, uh, there's a pink ribbon of stone and that's Sioux Quartzite. So that represents the southwestern corner of the state where there's a lot of deposits of this, this reddish stone that you'll find throughout uh, that corner of the state of Minnesota. So once again, it's a place that you're talking about government and the state history, but also state products as part of that decoration. I've been told that at least one type of stone in the capital is now extinct. Is that true, and which one is it? Yeah, we, we believe the, uh, the stone that you'll find in the Senate chamber, which is called a fleur de peche, which in French is peach flower, and it's a really beautiful purple marbled and huge grained uh, uh, texture to that, and it's a really uh, unique stone to this entire building. And so we believe the stone that we use, use in, that, in that chamber no longer exists in France. The quarry, because it's been quarried for so many centuries, is pretty much gone. Some people say that the Italian columns that are outside the Senate chamber and also outside the Supreme Court were not put together properly and that's why the columns don't match. Is that true? That, that's a, a good story that's been perpetuated for many generations in the Capitol, but we do have uh, letters that Cass Gilbert is writing to the Butler Ryan Company as they're doing the final kind of tweaking of those, those spaces. And he delineates, and he has a circle on for each one of these big colonnades that he wants on the center section, that one center piece turned one quarter this way. He wants another section taken from this column and moved to the other side. So he was fine tuning them with the intention of them not matching. So the idea was he wanted to have a variety of colors and patterns. So when you looked up and down that second floor, grand floor, you would see these beautiful vistas and you would have kind of just all these different colors coming together. And it's, when you take a close look, he did, he was very careful of where he wanted the different color schemes. So if you look toward the Senate side, the big columns that are in three pieces, those are all from uh, Italy, of course, but they all have a reddish to grayish tint to it. The ones on the Supreme Court side all have a greenish and gray tint. So he didn't have those colors mixed and matched. He wanted them separate for each side of the second floor. So from a historian's perspective, what stones represent Minnesota? What's the most important stonework that's in the Capitol building? Well, we talked about the Casota limestone, which is prevalent throughout every floor of the state capitol. So that really is the kind of the, the stone you'll see when you walk into the building. But we mentioned the granite columns from Minnesota. There's also the granite steps and foundation from the outside. So that was part of that compromise that Gilbert could use the white stone, but also needed to incorporate some granite and Minnesota local stone in the exterior. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thank you for joining us.